we're covering obviously one of the first the basic principles of the scriptures this afternoon um, the concept of going to heaven when we die and for the purposes of the internal audience here everybody in terms of from young to old um, it's probably the only way that you've ever thought about it with regard to the fact that we don't go to heaven and you know the proposition for this afternoon quite clearly is that the Bible teaches that we don't go to heaven uh, but I spent about half of my life believing that we went to heaven. Um, I, was, I was raised uh, with a very traditional upbringing, background, going to a Methodist church. And it was very clear, sort of from a young age upwards, that, that I believed in going to heaven. That's the message that was very clearly taught. And whilst I had an interest in reading the Bible, um, and I used to read a Gideon's Bible as well when that was given to me. And the interest is always there. It's a strange thing to say, but un until you can really understand these things and you see clearly these things, that, that we live in a world where those that are religious, and that's, a, that's an ever-diminishing number, they will, if they are Christians, probably believe in the concept of going to heaven. So I think on that basis, it is something that, that's worth consideration. I was staggered when I um, was introduced to the Christadelphians, and staggered's the right word, it's, it's an appropriate word. Um, I, was, I was given a book called Christendom Astray, it was written by one of the early um, members of the Christadelphian movement, Robert Roberts, and that's an interesting book to read because whilst the language is obviously reflective of the time at which it was written, it, it goes through the basic doctrines of the Christadelphian movement and pulls apart compared to Christendom astray, which is what the book is entitled, how, that doc how those doctrines and teachings have moved. So I think we'll quite conclusively show this afternoon that the Bible teaching concerning our future um, is not one where we go to heaven when we die. I think another really interesting thing when we come to read the scriptures and it took me a little while to get my head around an approach to this is that it can seem a strange a strange way of approaching addresses whereby a speaker gets up they talk about whatever it is they want to talk about and they hop around going from verse to verse from book to book in the bible and and to begin with i used to think well this is this is a strange way of doing it why not just go to a passage that conclusively and comprehensively draws out whatever it is as a theme or a point of principle or or a story uh, as a narrative you know in one go so it's, it's easier to digest and there is a very good reason for that and clearly the more familiar you you become with the scriptures the more in tune uh, you become with, with how it is structured how it is written how god has caused his word to be presented um and the reason is this and i i I make the point because we will be looking at a number of different verses with regards to our subject this afternoon. Um, but the way God has caused his Bible to be written over a significant period of time through multiple generations of men and women who have written his word is that it is written in the context of being God's unfolding purpose with consistency of theme and principle all the way throughout. And those principles are found in every book of the scriptures. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at something such as we are this afternoon or the principle of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth and be king in the earth. It's embedded throughout. So it's not the case that you can turn to a book and say this is a chapter on what happens when you die. Rather, there are chapters such as we've had read, with like Ecclesiastes 9, which we'll go to, which... Which I think, um, which I think, draw out and refer heavily to this theme. But yet we see the thread running throughout the whole of Scripture, which builds and and adds additional complexities and layers in refining the thinking as to exactly what God is getting at. So, I think that that's an important principle when you come to, for yourself seek to understand the scriptures that that's the way that it's been written wonderful themes eternal principles from start to finish 
as the whole of it builds, but it's expressed <coughs> through the eyes and the experiences of very different people living in very different circumstances, which, which provides a layer where it's applicable and relevant to whichever generation of people that you've ever lived in. So if we can start, please, um, by going to the Gospel of John and chapter 3. We've got recorded in John chapter 3 a very interesting statement. John was writing his gospel as he draws out on a number of occasions. We looked at one verse this morning, if you can remember, in uh, I think it was John 12 verse 16. Um, he wrote the gospel after the event. He wasn't writing it as he went through, and indeed there was a lot he didn't understand as he was going through his life, as I think we saw this morning. Um, he makes the statement in verse 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So it tells us very clearly that Jesus is in heaven, which we all understand, um, but that nobody else is. And all of the people that lived up to the point in time at which Jesus came on this earth, none of those are in heaven. So right at the outset we have a very clear statement that that is not where people go when they die. Because there's nobody there except for, as we understand from the scriptures, God, his son and the immortal beings that we that we know as angels, um, that we know as messengers who do work on God's behalf. So if we just start very basically by going back to Genesis just for a couple of moments, with that context in mind, it's worth reflecting on the way in which the Bible records for us the original humans were created, how they were made, the substance they were <coughs> comprised of. And it tells us there in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And what's really important in underpinning this theme of where we go when we die in the scriptures is uh, the word soul and, and the, the essential nature um, that we bear. And the word for soul is the Hebrew word nephesh, and it simply means a living, breathing creature. It's not something that <coughs> contains or holds an immortal element or aspect to it. It is entirely natural and it lives for a span. And in fact, what we're told through the scriptures is that when God created the earth, and he formed it with a specific purpose in mind that he would create a family on it, had formed it to be inhabited, as we read in Isaiah 45. Um, he was very clear that in the initial stages of creation, he needed the earth to be filled, because as we know, the planet is a big <coughs> place, and if you create a being that dies after approximately 70 years, the time it's going to take to get the population up uh, is, is going to take a very long time indeed. So the age of human beings has come down, as is recorded in the scriptures, it started by... Uh, living to centuries old, which we will all know Methuselah is the oldest in the scriptures, but over 900 years. Then the span of human beings is reduced to 120 years, and then it's finally reduced to 70 years. And we will know that broadly speaking, um, and certainly until very recently, you know, 70 was viewed as a good age, but even today, beyond the age of 70, you're into the, you're into the stage of life where you're very much hoping that your health holds up to permit you to do the things that you've done all your life and that is, that's only going to endure for so long. So there were limits to the span of life for this living soul. Um, we read in Genesis chapter 3, if you just turn over the page, um, that following Adam and Eve um, display disobedience to God that the the context in which these humans were going to live their life, it changed. 
And God says in verse 19, and they're principles that we will that we'll, that we'll understand. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. You know, the principle of work in society, and even indeed the narrative of the government about, us, about work. And, you know, David Cameron's forever saying it's the people who get on, the good people who work and, and, and show independence and contribute to society. Those are the ones we're looking to reward. That, you know, that's been a theme since 2010. Um, you know, it's, it's reflected here in verse 19 that God's saying you are going to have to work. And he's saying you're going to have to in the case of Adam because clearly there was no commerce, there was no developed society, um, that he, he was going to have to work from the ground to generate food to look after his family. And then we're told, for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. And so we're told the substance, I've taken you out of this, the dust, and you are going to go there um, once you die. And that was the same for everybody. It didn't matter whether you were a man, a woman, an animal, any kind of animal. You were made of the same stuff. You were a nephesh. You were a living, breathing entity that had a life for a period of time. And when that came to an end, then you went back to the ground, to the dust. So in Genesis chapter 7, we read um, that following the flood, in verse 21... And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of the birds and the cattle and the beasts and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. And so we are told there that life was extinguished and it didn't matter what you were. Uh, the, the importance of this for all of us is, um, if you come back to the reading that we had in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, <coughs> is that no matter how young you are, young or old, it's worth thinking about these things. What did we read in verse 12? For man also knoweth not his time. As the fishes happily swimming in the sea for they're taken in an evil net as the birds that are caught in a trap so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them and you know I think that's been brought to mind to, to the mind of society recently hasn't it with regards to that there's there's an endeavor by people to want to be able to live lives as they see fit within a framework that means that to a degree, everybody can do what they want without infringing what everybody else wants to do. And provided that takes place, um, then people want to pursue um, their own independent lives. And so there's absolute shock and horror and outrage when events such as Paris three weeks ago, I mean, they're happening all the time, you know, universities in Kenya or shopping malls in Turkey, it doesn't matter where it is, shootings in America, in the last couple of days, the bottom line is people are outraged because that mode of thinking is threatened by those that are taking away lives. The point that the scripture is making here is that it doesn't matter what the circumstances are that will result in the end of your life, the point is, is that your life will end. And you don't know when it will end. Um, when you start living your life. You live it forwards and you have your expectations and your plans but you don't know when it's going to come to an end. And so the scripture in Ecclesiastes 9, what Solomon's really getting at is that you should really think about that because if something happens and you haven't thought about the serious and deeper aspects, the questions of life, then you know, you're going to be found wanting. That's what the scripture says. And so it says about human nature and building on what we read in Genesis, in verse 5 it says, the living know that they shall die, and that is the truth, everybody knows that. And then it says that once you're dead, 
you know not anything, neither have any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And unless you've done something truly notable for good or for bad, within two generations you will be forgotten. You will not be called to mind after that point in time. Because the people of life just didn't know you. And there's no reason for people to keep up a continuing conversation or narrative or to reflect your presence in the current lives because it's so long ago in the context of a span of a man's life. So that's what that's saying. The memory is, is, is really quite quickly forgotten. And then it says in verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. It's really emphasising the point that when you go to the grave, there's nothing there. Um, you go into oblivion. And the scripture um, uses specific words to draw this out for us so that we're clear about what it's saying. Um, if you come across to Psalm 146, I think this makes the point for us. And in Psalm 146, we were introduced to a new term. And it tells us there, in verse 4, that a man, any man's life, his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day when he dies, his thoughts perish. And we're introduced to that term there, perish. And the scripture speaks using two terms very clearly about two different classes of people. The first class is people who perish and the second class is people who sleep. And those two people, they're all the same in the sense that they've all been given opportunity of life and they've lived their lives, but some perish and some sleep. And so it's worth us exploring exactly what that means. So if you can come across to Isaiah 26, we'll see how the two different classes of people are spoken about. We'll look first of all at the, uh, those that perish. We're told in Isaiah 26 and verse 13... O Lord our God, for the Lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. So that's just reflecting the fact that there, are diff there have been different nations, different kings, different rulers who've ruled the people. But that verse is saying, we know you God are our only true Lord. And it says of all these other Lords that have been um, put in positions of authority over them. It says in verse 14, they are dead, they shall not live, they are deceased, they shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. And you notice how, how emphatic the language is there. It builds, doesn't it? It, it? You know, it could just say they are dead, but it doesn't, it tells you they're dead. It tells you they're not living. It tells you they are deceased, it tells you they aren't going to rise, and it tells them that they've been destroyed and the memory of them will perish. That is very clearly telling us that these people do not exist, either here or anywhere else. If you turn over the page, it speaks of another class of people. These aren't the dead men who ruled um, and impose themselves in positions of authority over the nation of Israel. These people are spoken of as being attached to God. And it says in verse 19, Thy dead men, so these are people who were dead but they are gods, shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So that's very clearly telling us that those who are associated with God, they are going to, remember in Genesis it said, dust thou art and you're going back to the dust. Here it says you're going to come out of the dust. 
This introduces us to the principle of the resurrection, which links in clearly with going to heaven, um, but it's spoken of in a different way in the scriptures compared to certainly what I was taught growing up uh, in a Methodist church. You come across to 1 Corinthians 15, And whilst the theme of resurrection runs throughout all of the scriptures, as we just looked at in Isaiah 26, um, 1 Corinthians 15 is a chapter which, which talks very heavily about the theme, the principle of resurrection. And we're told there in verse 12, If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So that's the starting point of this section in this chapter. And the Apostle Paul is saying, you know, we're preaching that Jesus rose from the dead, just as we do here um, at this meeting place. Um, but how come if we're preaching that, some people aren't convinced? And they say that that didn't happen. And then we go through a thought process here with the Apostle Paul, where he concludes that actually, if you don't believe in the resurrection then there's no hope, there's nothing, there's no heaven going, there's no, there's no alternative working of the process that God has implemented and put in place between himself and all of his creation. And so we read there, if we follow the verses, it says in verse 13, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So that's a logical statement. And if Christ therefore isn't risen and he's dead, because we know historically he certainly existed as a man, there's no denying that is a fact. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. So if Christ didn't rise from the dead, it's pointless us even being here preaching about the things of the Bible. Your faith is vain and your false witnesses of God in verse 15. Um, in that God didn't raise up Jesus if the dead rise not at the end of verse 15. For if the dead rise not in verse 16, then is Christ, not Christ raised. And verse 17, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then we get the two terms that I've spoken about in the same verse in verse 18. He says, if none of this has happened, then those which are fallen asleep in Christ, they aren't really asleep, they're perished, that's what he says. And so in that single verse we're drawing out this difference of being asleep in Christ, having a relationship, a connection with God through Christ, that's what that's talking about, and if you don't, then you're perished. So the sleep and the perishing. The, the resurrection is critical to that, which is the means, as we'll look at now, um, by which a man or a woman can be saved, not through going to heaven. Let's use a test case to, to examine the principles that we've, that we've spoken about so far. Um, if we have a look at David, David will show us clearly that his life, his prospects, his experiences have conformed with what we've talked about. If you start in 2 Kings 7, 2, Kings 7, 2 Samuel 7 please. Two Samuel seven is an important chapter in the Bible. It's an important chapter because <coughs> in it David is provided with important promises that build upon previous covenanted promises that God had made with 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 other people, such as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Noah. Um, here he's talking to David. And he says to David in verse 12, When you, thy days be fulfilled, when you reach the end of your life, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, so there's the term, David's going to sleep, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So David's throne, which was... Um, in Jerusalem that throne we're told is going to be there's going to be a kingdom that's set up with the 
centre of that kingdom at Jerusalem on David's throne. But that's going to happen some significant time after David because we're told it's going to come um, out of his bowels. He's not going to see that happen. He's going to be asleep. So <coughs> what are David's prospects? And what were David's expectations? If you come across to Psalms in Psalm 71... In Psalm 71, David's, David's been afflicted with poor health. And so he, he's reflecting this in the comments that we look at now. And he says in verse 20 of Psalm 71, he says, Thou God, which has showed me great and sore troubles, shalt quicken or bring me to life again, and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. So even though David was told, you're going to sleep David's expectation in verse 20 here is that he will be raised again from the earth. And this is confirmed for us in the preaching of the gospel by the apostles after the Lord Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead himself and gone to the right hand of God. If you come across to Acts chapter 2, that tells us um, about David. you look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 25 we've got some interesting passages that just bear out what, what I've been saying it says in verse 25 David speaketh concerning him Jesus I foresaw the Lord always before my face for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So that tells us that David was communicated with by God, that the promises that we read in 2 Samuel 7 were given to him and that he believed them. And that's a fundamental, important principle when we think about the Bible. It, it's not, um, it's not a, an inanimate book in the same way that all other books are inanimate. It's spoken of as being a living word. It's a relevant word. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter at what time throughout the history of man you have lived. This word is relevant and it makes certain promises. David believed those promises. And so, building on what we've just read then, in verse 29, the apostle goes on to say, Men and brethren... Let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David who clearly believed that Jesus was going to come. David, the apostle says, is both dead and buried and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. And if you go to Israel today and you go to Mount Zion and it's a really quite a small little hill, David's tomb um, is, is something that, that's a very popular tourist attraction. Um, but we're told here um, that David was dead and buried. Verse 30, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, that we read in 2 Samuel 7, that of the fruit of David's loins, according to his flesh, his lineage, his genealogy, he would raise up Christ to sit on his, that's David's, throne. And in verse 31, David, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. And so it's concluded for us by, by, uh, by drawing out to our attention in verse 34, David is not ascended into the heavens. And so David, as, we, as the scriptures made very clear to us, is definitely not in the heavens, he's definitely not perished, He's definitely asleep in the dust of the ground, awaiting, as we've read there, for Jesus to return. Um, that's something that's relevant to all of us. If you come across to 1 Thessalonians 4, we read some more about people like David, those that are asleep. 
And it tells us there in verse 13, Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those which are asleep. He says, about all those people that you know about who are asleep because they believe the things of God's promises. He says, don't sorrow about it because you're not like other people that don't have hope. Verse 14 says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto to you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So it's talking now about the time when Jesus is going to return and we've got the living and we've got those that have died but they believe what God has promised them through his Bible and they aren't, they aren't perished. They are going to be woken up as if from a sleep. That's what 1 Thessalonians 4 is telling us. And Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15 tells us that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Back to what we read in Acts chapter 2 and 2 Samuel 7. That there's going to be a kingdom set up through Christ from Jerusalem, which is the throne of David. And all of this is going to happen at a certain point in time. This is another reason why... The principle of going to heaven when you die, it, it doesn't work, um, even though the scripture is silent on it. In any case, if you come to Acts 17, uh, the, the Apostle Paul makes a very important point. It says in verse 31, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, which is clear if you read the whole of Acts 17, is Jesus Christ, whereof he hath given assurance to all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So again we come back to this theme that the enabler of all of this is Jesus having been raised from the dead. But there is in the Greek a specific day when this will happen there's no ongoing process when you die that everybody goes to heaven there is a specific day in which this will be fulfilled and the principle of God's kingdom on this earth will begin to become a reality and so there are things that we need to think about um, with regards to our relationship with God and our consideration as to our mortality and the fact that we really aren't here for that long and so we owe it to ourselves to think about the really important outcomes that we want in life not to be short-termist and not to be just focused on the tangible or the short-term gains or benefits that this society preaches so freely to us to really pursue after it's the long-term outcomes and if we want to be on God's side and we want to be for God because we believe he as our father and our creator is developing a family that we want to be part of then we have to we have to reflect in our lives through action that that actually means something to us uh, if you come across to Jeremiah 30 for a second they're just sobering words that we have here The Middle East is an area of the world that experiences such extreme volatility. And all of it emanates from Israel. The Islamic State at its root has issues with Israel and it doesn't matter what issue comes out of the Middle East, the fact that the nation state of Israel is once again in existence is a problem. I mean they are unique as a, as a diaspora. As a, as a migration flow of people, they are the first ones ever to have left a homeland, not fallen to the principle of assimilation, and 
retain their identity, their independence, their specific culture and way of life. And they're now back in the land. Jeremiah 30 is all about that. <coughs> Obviously it's not tonight's subject, but it says in verse 3, Lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah. Now we've seen, or some of us in the room have seen, but we're all aware that the nation state of Israel exists. And Jeremiah says, records for us in verse 24 of this chapter, he says, The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he has done it. Until he's done what? Until the nation state of Israel is once again in the earth. And that, says Jeremiah, is performing the intents of his heart. In the latter days, he shall consider it. And that's for us to think about. We've got to consider events like that, just as we have to, as Ecclesiastes 9 advises us. Man doesn't know his own time, doesn't know when it's going to come to an end. Think about these things. We live in an age where people don't think generally. We live in an age that's very education and academia driven for the younger generations that are coming through. You know, an aspiration that I'm currently got 51% of the population going to university. Now, on a hierarchical basis of any society that wants to follow the principles of democracy, that's not a sustainable, nor is it, nor is it a logical thing, really, that, that's being pursued. But, but, but what it's saying is that they want people to learn, they want people to be educated, they want people to think for themselves. But at the same time, that's in a context of being more passive than any generation has ever been, needing information instantly, needing everything instantly, and not taking time to really meditate on the, the greater questions of life. And I would urge you to really think about those things carefully if you aren't baptised. So if you come across to Acts 17 for our final um, passage, we'll pick up where we left off about the one day of judgment that God has placed in his plan that we believe will come to pass soon. The Apostle Paul preached that. He said, this is what's going to happen. And in verse 32, what was the response of the people? When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, that we don't go to heaven when we die, we sleep in the dust of the earth and we will be awoken at a point in time on a specific day to be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ based on what we said we would do when we were baptised against what we actually have done. When they heard it, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. I pray that for all those in this room that aren't baptised, that you will think carefully about directionally where your life is going, how you are growing as a person, and how you think about your relationship with God, with God's word, and specifically, you know, the promises that we have on offer. And that you will want to hear again of these matters, so that at a point in time, whilst opportunity remains, you might want to become associated with all the members here as we await for Jesus to return and set up his Father's kingdom.